Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is Episode 4, The West Bank Separation Wall. The West Bank Separation Wall is a giant concrete partition designed to keep the Palestinians of the West Bank in and keep Israelis out. It's received attention in the international press lately due to the opening of the street artist Banksy's The Walled Off Hotel, which highlights the situation. However, few people outside of Israel and Palestine truly understand the enormity and consequences of having a giant concrete wall run through the middle of their cities. My guest today is Tamara Halase, owner of Tamara Tours, a tour company focused on highlighting the best of the West Bank for foreign tourists. We discuss the history of Israel and Palestine, the West Bank separation wall, and what it's like to travel Palestine's West Bank. And at the end of this episode, find out how to enter this week's giveaway. All right. So today's guest, we have Tamar. He is the owner of Tamar Tours and Tamar does tours of the West Bank and Palestine. Welcome, Tamar. How are you today? Thank you very much. I'm doing good. Thank you. All right. So today we're talking about specifically about the wall in Bethlehem and then also about general issues in the West Bank and Palestine. So why don't you share a little bit about your background because I met you on a tour of the West Bank and one of the things you do on the tour is tell your background and it's extremely interesting. Okay, so I come from a family that originally came with the Crusaders, at the time of the Crusaders, and we settled here in Palestine. Our grandfather became a Muslim so that's why part of my family are Muslims and part of us are Christians. Uh, we lived in a town outside Jerusalem, so we are considered as part of Jerusalem. We are more seculars, secular Muslims, like we don't practice religion. In politics, we were active. Uh, my dad was a leader in the Communist Party, and most of my family members are from uh, the left wing. Part of my family live in a refugee camp because they had to leave in '48 when Israel uh, was established, and they settled near Bethlehem, the refugee camp named called uh, Dheshe. Now, in the refugee camp, that's where you learn some of the politics and you know more about the Palestinian history, what happened in 48 and afterwards. Because of my family, I was involved kind of in politics, but I was not really interested in being in it in 100%. I started doing tours. It was created after the second intifada. Intifada means uprising. Now, the first one was in uh, 87. The second one started in 2000. The goal was, they used to call it, they call it the alternative tourism. Now, alternative tourism, the beginning was to show about the situation. Like when the wall was start built, uh, they start building the wall and what's happening with one state, two state and all of that. But then it started to develop to show more about the life of the Palestinians, the positive side of the Palestinians. And this is how we started. Before I got there, I thought I knew more about Palestine than I knew. You know, it was one of those things when I got there, I realized I know so much. I've heard these words my whole life and I don't understand the situation at all. So, yeah, keep going. I, I, I love hearing it. How I started, it was by coincidence. One of my dad friends talked to my dad about maybe having me to be part of the committee. At that time, there was a committee created against building the wall. People in the beginning, they didn't take it uh, seriously because they said, you know, Israel is not that crazy to build the wall. And even they are going to build it, it will be in uh, some areas, not the whole West Bank. Now, the other thing, why the wall was built? It was built as a response for the wave of suicide bombings that was happening at that time during the Second Intifada. And when the World War start, they start building it and they say, okay, it's coming in our uh, town. So as I said, you know, they spoke to my dad and my dad said, okay, you can go and speak with him. I was not interested in the beginning. In one of the evenings, I was sitting with my friends. It was during Ramadan, as I remember. Usually after we end the fasting, and you eat, you go out with your friends, you know, to smoke shisha or to drink or something. So uh, we were standing outside uh, a shop and my dad friend came with a car and without saying anything to me, 
I found myself in the car. And it was like fun. It was like kidnapping someone and put him in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and he said to me, not a word. Shut up. I said, okay, okay. I knew where he wants me to go. I was wearing my pajamas. So <laughs> I went to the tent protest. And I, there was like a big gathering. It was the first time that I met Israelis who are activists. Like before I used to meet them, you know, I, meet, I met Israelis, like normal people. And soldiers, because the West Bank is under the military control of the Israeli army. So we always see them. But it was the first time that they saw activists. And then I saw also foreigners. And there was people that I know already. So I was sitting and I was listening. And they asked me to translate something. And I did that. And at the same night, they said to me, OK, you're in. So this is how I started. This was the beginning. You know, it was around 2002. So my role was in the committee was to do translation and also to talk about, to tour the people who come and to show them the effects of the separation rule. Of course, there's information we need to know about, you know, the families and what's happening in the families and everything. The first interview, I was pushed, like nobody said, okay, this is Tamar, you have to do the interview. It was with Reuters. And I was like... (laughs) <laughs> refusing. <laughs> they said, I'm not going to do that. They said, no, you have to do it. I said, no. They said, you have to. Then I had to go and sp- speak with, you know, in front of the Reuters. And I was like, I never really liked what I was saying. But if you met me at that time, I'm not going to deny. Everybody was angry because of what's happening. And then it's not just about us. It's about how many people were affected by building the wall. And the other thing, when you see Israelis, I think the Israelis also realize that it's not going to be good for them. That's why they, you saw, like, in the protest, there was Israelis, like, there was the Ayush, Peace Now, and everything. But still, I think it was not effective because we were coming from a situation that was difficult on both sides. So we couldn't, despite that many people tried to do what they, the efforts, but nobody could stop the world. The world was already done. Afterwards, I got involved in peace meetings and I became also a peace activist because this is where I thought that it's not just to do tours and to talk about the political situation from the Palestinian side. I think it was important for us, like me and others, to meet the other side and to understand why the situation is happening, what the other side is thinking about us Believe me, it was difficult because we had, sometimes we had to, there was no permits and it was difficult to cross to the Israeli side. But we we managed the way and we met Israelis and we used to go to gatherings and interfaith dialogues and everything. That helped me a lot to know more about the Israeli side. And helped me in my work. Then things start to change about the mentality, the way of thinking and everything. So we realize, again, me and others, that it's not just about the Palestinian side. It's also there is another people living in the same land that, in a way, they are also paying the price. But not the same level, but they are paying the price. So that's why things start to change of the, um, the way that we talk. So, yeah. This is how things started. So let's back up a little bit and explain what the Bethlehem Wall is. And because I think it's been in the news a lot lately, Banksy just opened the Wall Off Hotel, which is brought, and we'll talk about that later, but I don't know if people outside of the area truly appreciate how big this wall is and what it does. So can you explain just the engineering and physics of this wall? The idea of the separation between Palestinians and Israelis was before, but the Israelis didn't see that there is a need for it. When the Second Intifada started, and they didn't like came and build it immediately. Uh, when things start going much worse, and as I said, you know, with the suicide bombings that started, that's when Ariel Sharon, who became the Prime Minister of Israel, decided to build the separation rule. Now, the planned one, almost 700 uh, kilometers. And so far, they built 400. 
between concrete wall and electric fences. The height between four and a half to nine meters. The Israelis say that they built it to prevent suicide bombings. Now, they know as we know, and it happened after that, if someone wants to enter to do something, they can. That's why some Palestinians start saying that the wall is not about security as much as it's to isolate Jerusalem and take all the good land from the West Bank, like to push the Palestinians or the areas full of Palestinians out. Now, when the hotel was built, or when they announced about the hotel, it was more to show or to let the people remember that there is an ugly wall built, but in a way to realize it's between two people. And for some, it's now the obstacle for both people to communicate. Because if you want to work for peace, you have to talk about, you have to work on the people level. You know, you have the officials can meet, okay, but where, what's the point of having an agreement if it's on the people level, there is no peace. So you need both sides to communicate. With the wall is there, it's more difficult, especially for the Israelis to come. So with this wall, it's built on Palestinian land. Yeah, and there are 67 borders. So how did they actually do the construction process? Because I read a little bit about it, about it in the museum, but I was kind of shocked. <laughs> the process that they even, it's bad enough that there is a wall. But then the actual process that they did to build it, it just explain how it got built because it shocked me. Okay. Because I, you know, we witnessed how they built it. They come and say they have the maps and they come like, for example, they came and told our uh, municipality that we are informing that we are going to build the wall in this section. So next time when you come, I will take you to that area and you can see it. And also, I can try to send you some photos when they were building it. Yeah, that would be more. great. We'll share it. Yeah, to know more about how they used to build it. And so that area will be security area. Most of them come on the land. So the land will have like olive trees or almonds or something like that. So they come and take all the trees and they start digging. I don't know how many, I don't remember how many meters under the ground. And they bring one part of the wall. It's like a T, but opposite. So they put the head underneath and they cover it with cement and they put them together. So it will be difficult in the future for anyone to try to dig or demolish or anything. So it's difficult. And they were working fast. So like in one day, they will, I don't know how many meters they will finish. So this is how they used to do it. When I sent you the photos, then, then you will understand what I'm talking about. Usually when you see it, how they start building it, that's when people understand what I'm talking about. So we'll have the photos up on the post for this episode up on the website. So, and that website will be in the show notes. So you guys can go in and take a look. So what I was reading was that sometimes they would seize people's land to build the wall and not give them really notice or any judicial, there's no way that they could fight it. You can go on a protest, but it was difficult to, like, to do anything. It was very difficult, you know. As I remember, we used to go on a protest, and the soldiers would look at us. Sometimes there will be, like, clashes, tear gas, and uh, shooting. But, yeah, it was difficult. Like, in some areas, they allowed people to come, but then in other areas, it was difficult. Uh, And they were always see Israeli soldiers standing there and not allowing anyone to approach. And if they try to approach, then there is a special unit that they used to come and arrest people from, you know, they choose them and say, okay, we want to arrest this one. And I remember some friends, you know, they were Israelis and uh, Palestinians or foreigners that they were arrested and beaten at the areas that uh, we used to go. Because at that time, we used to go every day. And not just in my town, we used to go also... Uh, we went to Bethlehem, near Bethlehem, and near Ramallah, and in other areas. So they didn't allow, especially when there is a protest. Even today, like they do in some areas near Bethlehem or in Ramallah, when people go on a protest, they respond with tear gas and arresting people and even attacking uh, journalists. They don't want anyone to see what's uh, really happening. 
So I saw the wall in Bethlehem, but the plan is for the wall to go completely around the West Bank. Is that right? Yeah. It's to, it's now like separating the West Bank from Israel. That's what they say. So that's what they say that it is. In practicality, what is it? Well, when you are touring people and you tell them, okay, the wall is built to separate between the West Bank and Israel. And then they discover that there are parts in the West Bank that is considered as Israel. So it's confusing for people. Like, what do you mean it's separating between Israel and the West Bank? And then we discover that there are parts of the, the West Bank is considered as Israel. Like the settlements, or if you go uh, near the Dead Sea or Jordan River, all these areas. And the other confusing thing for them is that when they know that the West Bank was divided to three zones, A, B, and C. And C zone is totally under Israeli control. So they say, so how, how can you say that it's between the West Bank and, and Israel? And then we discover this. It's difficult to even to explain to them, you know, or the, even for Israelis. I think, you know, some Israelis who come with me, when they discover that, they, it was confusing for them. They say, but, you know, for Israelis, some of them, they know that, okay, the wall was built between Israel and the West Bank, and uh, the Palestinians and the West Bank. But then when they come, like, you know, when you are driving from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, you are going through the West Bank. And then you discover that the Dead Sea area is in the West Bank area. It's on the other side. They say, how, this is like, you know, hard to understand. And then, yeah, we know, but we don't have like a, a reasonable answer for it. So the parts of Israel or the parts of the West Bank that Israel controls are yeah. typically around the main highways and around the border. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, like the settlements, it's controlled by them. And between the Palestinian cities is also controlled by them. So they really control all the, not the, the depopulated land? Like, I will tell you, I will explain now what is zone A and B and C again. Zone A, this was uh, divided or they made it through also agreement that was signed in 1993. Now, zone A means the areas that have full population of Palestinians. The Palestinians have kind of full control, but the Israeli army have the right to enter anytime they want. Let's say a city like Ramallah or Bethlehem, they can enter during the day or at night and arrest people, and they leave. Now, the Palestinian Authority cannot do anything against that. So it's almost like 90% of the West Bank. Now, B area, like where I live, makes control. Palestinians have the civil administration. Israelis have the security. Almost 21% of the West Bank. C area, totally controlled by the Israelis. So you can say, you know, the West Bank in total is like 21% of historical Palestine. Now, when we say historical Palestine means Palestine before 48, before Israel was established. I think in numbers, it's like uh, the West Bank is 5,846 square kilometers, something like that. The majority of the West Bank is still under the Israel control. Now that the wall is up, how does it affect people who live in the West Bank's lives? In the beginning, it was difficult because everybody, it was, it's one country. And you notice that, you know, when you drove from Jerusalem to the West Bank, it's like, it's not that far. It's like when you cross it, it's like in one minute you are in the West Bank. It was difficult in the beginning on the people because most of them used to work and study and even do shopping and everything. And they have relatives, cousins, everything in Israel, in East Jerusalem and in Israel. Uh, when the war was built, they were affected. Education was affected because many had to decide to, they used to study in, uh, in East Jerusalem. And they had to go back to the West Bank and to study there. And I remember where I used to study in the university, in the University, one of the colleges, the places where people used to study of the students, it was in East Jerusalem. And because it was difficult for the students to go, they had to bring them to the university back or to prepare like classes for them. Before that happened, we used to like uh, smuggle ourselves in some areas to go to Jerusalem, to East Jerusalem. And uh, it was action. 
adventure because the road that we used to take, we used to call it Tura Bura. From, it's, it's an area in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, but it was similar to here. So we used to call it Turabura. And the way that you walk there, it's like climbing a hill. You don't see if there are soldiers up there or not. And if you are going down, you don't know if there are soldiers or not. So it was like risky. That was from the educational. Of course, from working, many people lost their jobs. And then there was the medical issue that people who used to get treatment or go to the hospital in East Jerusalem, it become difficult for them. And if they want to go, they need uh, like a permit to go there. And they have to prove that they need to go to the hospital. They need to get a medical file. The other thing was the separation between the families. Like in my town, there was, uh, there is now almost like 1,000 separated families. The husband live uh, on the West Bank side or the wife uh, live on the West Bank, the West Bank side and the husband live in the Israeli side or the wow. opposite. The wife live on the Israeli side and the husband live on the West Bank side. Now, this is something that I didn't realize until I went there, but Palestine, the West Bank and East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip are all part of Palestine, but they're not connected. The Gaza Strip is very far in the south by the sea and by Egypt. The West Bank is in west, as on the western side of Jerusalem and east, but East Jerusalem is also Palestinian, but they're not contiguous, right? They don't touch. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's why, like, even people when they ask me, like, when you have a Palestinian state, how is the situation with Gaza and um, and the West Bank? How it will work? You say we don't know, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> they will find a way. Like they did, you know, after when they signed Oslo, they opened the highway between Gaza and uh, the West Bank. But the final thing, it's go through Israel. So that means that the Israelis will control it. Does the Gaza Strip have a wall similar to the wall on the West Bank? In one part, yes. There are fences all over Gaza. And recently, Egypt started making an iron wall between their borders and Gaza because of Hamas existing uh, in or controlling the Gaza Strip. So, yeah, you can say that there is also uh, a wall around Gaza. Now, Hamas is something we haven't talked about yet. And most, I don't think, and I'm sure that a lot of people that listen are much more educated than me about these topics, but I did not realize that Hamas was really isolated to the Gaza Strip and not in the other two parts of Palestine. Can you talk a little bit about Hamas? Hamas was created uh, in the 80s, in the beginning of the first intifada. And it's part of the Muslim Brotherhood. The founders originally came from Gaza. That's why like, they have the presence in Gaza. They refuse also agreement, but they get benefit of it. And this is what happened we know, when they went to the elections in 2006. At that time, winning the elections was a surprise for everybody, even for Hamas itself, because they didn't expect uh, to win the elections. As I remember, there was kind of sanctions on the Palestinians because Hamas won the elections. Uh, so the Palestinians wanted to make a unity government to overcome the sanctions. Somehow, I think Hamas didn't like that. So they took Gaza by force. And they kicked the Palestinian Authority out. So that was like around 2007. So Hamas is now in Gaza. They have members in the West Bank or in East Jerusalem, but they don't have that much influence because Fatah is controlling the West Bank. So they are not allowing uh, Hamas members to do anything. That's why you don't hear about them in the West Bank. Now for you, the listeners of the History Fangirl podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. If this interview with Tamar has got you curious about what's going on in Palestine, I would recommend you check out the book The Way of the Spring, Life and Death in Palestine by Ben Aaron Reich. It came out last year. It's a great description of what's really going on there. So he is an American writer who has spent three years traveling and living in the West Bank, staying with locals. And he's been all over. He's been in Ramallah and Hebron and Bethlehem. And along the way, he's written 
many articles for American news outlets and he took all of that information and knowledge and put it into this book. The reviews are fantastic. Um, one of the reviews, which is one of the reasons that I got curious to look further into this book was I wanted to start over and reread as soon as I was finished. So if you're interested in learning more about Palestine when this is done and you're not going to be able to go there yourself, I would definitely check out this audiobook. So the political situation is not necessarily a high alert tense, but it's a little bit tense right now. Not as tense as it has been in the past. And Israel is letting tourist groups come in to the West Bank. But I saw recently that you posted an article that the Israeli government is considering not allowing that. Have you heard anything new about that or why they would think that that would be a good idea in the first place? The Israeli government, you know, this the current one, they come with these crazy ideas. And one of the important things in Israel is tourism. And sending groups or tourists to the West Bank is a benefit for the Israeli companies. Because few people would like to come, you know, by themselves here. Like, okay, I will drive the car and everything. Now, to come and say we are not going to allow the tourists to go to the West Bank, you are destroying the Israeli companies. Because let's say there is a group, a religious group from, uh, let's say, San Francisco, who want to come to the Holy Land. And the most important place for them is Bethlehem, the Church of Nativity. And to come and tell them, okay, you can come and go around in the West Bank, uh, sorry, in Israel, but you cannot go to Bethlehem because it's the West Bank. And if they, if they would say, okay, we'll give you the visa, but only for Israel, not for the West Bank. If you want to go to the West Bank, there is no visa. Then the group will say, okay, we don't want to go. So that means that the hotels will be affected, the restaurants, the tour agencies, the buses, everything. So that's why even the Israeli companies stood against uh, this topic. And they say, no, we don't want that because you are destroying us. So for now, we didn't hear anything, but I don't think that it will, it will happen. Good. I think that people going there is a good thing. People come and they see a lot of things in the West Bank. We went to Jericho. We went to uh, the Jordan River. The next week, I actually went to the Jordan River in Jordan, so it was cool to see it on both sides. And then we went to the Church of the Nativity. But while it was actually a stop on your tour, why did you decide to put it on your tour as an actual tourist stop? And how long have you been doing that? And what is the effect usually on, on your tourists of seeing the wall? It was from the beginning when they start uh, building it. I think the idea or everybody agreed that it is something that people should see. And it, it was not just from us. It came also from foreigners. Because it, you know, it was covered by the media and everybody wanted to see it. Especially it came after the Berlin Wall was uh, destroyed. And then they say, okay, we got rid of one and then we discovered there is another one. And even the Israelis, I think there are many Israelis or some Israelis who wanted to see it. And they want the people to see it. So that's why we start putting it to show the effects of it. Not just on the Palestinian side, but also... You know, when people come and say we need to bring peace between both sides. Yeah, but look, here is the obstacle, the war and uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians, uh, Palestinians cannot meet like before. There is no, uh, people cannot go freely as before. Now, why we put it in the tour? Because everybody comes and they want to see it. They want to see the war that everybody is talking about. And it's a surprise for everybody who comes. Because they never expected that the world would be like this. The other thing is that we give them the chance to write on it. So they leave messages for both sides. But usually the Palestinian side who see it and the foreigners. The Israelis, few, few of them see them. But it's more about letting people see that this is the situation. This is the main obstacle, if you want to say, for both sides to communicate. Now, people sometimes ask me, if the wall is removed, what is the guarantee that nothing will happen? There is no guarantee, because you need to prepare the people or both sides for it. You cannot just come and take it and say, okay, go back as things was in the 70s or in the 80s or the beginning of the 90s. No, things cannot happen like that. 
It's important also to show the Israelis that as long as the war is being there, this is one of the things that is an obstacle for both sides to communicate, along with other things that's happening. But the war is important to show it to everybody. And it's a t- tourist attraction. People love it. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is that it is both a symbol of oppression, but it was really just emotionally difficult to see it and realize that this was a situation. And like, like the world is full of terrible situations. And, you know, I've spent a couple of years doing Teach for America. So I spent a couple of years in the United States working on education disparities, but that's not my full-time career goal. And when you throw yourself into one thing, you quickly realize how many other situations there are in the world that are oppressive that you just don't even know. And then once you know about them, what do you do? Actually being there and seeing it was really emotional. And I didn't, I don't think I knew that I was going to spend the last like 20 minutes of the tour just crying when you're like in Jericho seeing this 7,000 year old city and it feels very historical. But then to see like this modern concrete symbol of oppression, like it is actually oppression, but it also symbolizes oppression. And it just like, I, it just kind of destroyed me for the day. And then you think how selfish you are because I'm not even living with this. So I do think that it's seeing it is really important. If you're going to go to the West Bank, you shouldn't get out of there without being faced with it. Well, the other thing is we want to show people and we want them to learn that despite that this is happening, it shouldn't affect our lives. On the contrary, we are making it the motivation for us to continue. Now, some people say, but, you know, it's not good to adjust with it. It's not about adjusting with it or not. It's there, it's there. But we shouldn't allow it to affect our lives. We should be bigger and stronger than it and to continue with our life and to show that no matter what's happening, we always look forward. And we are people who love life and we should enjoy it. So this is the other thing that we want people to see. Yeah, when I was there, I, I realized that this is the kind of place that you really could go to for like a week. I know a guy who stayed after, the, so I went to a conference in Israel and then I went um, and did your tour on during that week when I was there. But I know somebody who was at the conference who stayed for a whole month in the West Bank just traveling around. There's so much to see and life really is pleasant and delicious. <laughs> Like, really? Yeah. The food is really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But the other thing is, you know, what surprised people also is that even if we say, like, okay, there are clashes near the wall, you know, where were we stopped. But then what surprised them is that, you see, there are clashes here or, like, near Ramallah. But then when you go inside the city, you see people sitting, relaxing, watching a uh, football match, real football, not American football, but, you know, from Europe, and smoking shisha or going to a party or to a wedding or something like that. This is surprising. They say, but, you know, there is clashes there happening. Or there is this wall. I say, yeah, but that doesn't mean that it have to stop your life. You have to move on. Like, even, you know, when I tell them, we used to finish in Ramallah. And sometimes I finish with uh, other tours in Ramallah around evening. And then they see people sitting in the bars and in the restaurants. And this is like a pleasant surprise for them. To see that, you know, people are sitting, relaxing, and having a good laugh and enjoying. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean... And the food. And the food. Oh, the food. (laughs) I So, towards the end, before you go to the wall, um, we went to this dessert shop, and I had knafe, and it was... It's fried cheese covered in nuts and sugar and honey. It is, like, insanely delicious. And then I went to Jordan the next week, and there's a lot of... Obviously, there's a lot of Palestinians in Amman... And so there's a couple of places where you can buy it there. And I probably ate two or three slices a day for a week after that. <laughs> okay, so it's good. Much, yeah. Well, well, it's like, it's like a meal. You know, when they made it, they made it as a meal also. Oh, really? It was like a breakfast? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like sometimes when you are in a hurry or you need to go and you don't have time for breakfast, you can stop at one of these places and eat it as breakfast because it gives you energy the whole day. In Nablus, where they created it, in the morning, and I saw it, they put it in bread, in pita, and they eat it as a sandwich. Mm, that would be good. Yeah, <laughs> you um, should try it. 
I will try any form of knafa that somebody hands me. I will I will do it. The other thing too is that um, when I was in Jordan, there are so many Palestinians in Jordan just because of the way things are. So a lot of the dress shops have the traditional Palestinian design dresses in them, and they're just so beautiful. And I like Palestine is just a really beautiful place and I'm really glad that I went but the wall is yeah it's just like this big thorn in the middle of a really beautiful place yeah like people sometimes ask me they say so what do you feel when you see it like because I every time I take people there I say well by that I don't feel anything anymore with it like it's there and it's there but we we look at it like when there is a new graffiti something happening like sometimes they bring a projector, and I remember in the World Cup, they start showing the games on the wall. Oh, really? And they brought chairs and tables and shishas and beer and everything. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that's the other thing, too, is that it's guarded at the checkpoints, but it's not like there's a guard too much along it. Well, I would tell you why in that area, in that area, like where we stopped in the end, that used to be the main road to Jerusalem. Now, next to it, or on the way, that's where Rachel's tomb, Rachel, the wife of Jacob, she died there. So, in a way, they built the wall around it in a circle to protect the Israelis or the Jews who come and visit the tomb. That's why you see there are lots of towers around it, and it's guarded. And there is, like, Israeli soldiers inside. That's why there is always clashes in that area, not in another area. Okay. It's also covered in street art and some of the most significant pieces of street art that people, like when people think of street art, some of the images that they think of are actually in the West Bank. How did street art become such a movement there? Was it a particular artist? I know Banksy's, we saw some of his work and he's famous for doing work there, or was it a general community movement? Like how did that take off? I think it was back to Germany you know, when the, when the wall was there and there was like of, uh, lots of art, uh, street art on it. So when the wall, the wall start, uh, they start being building it here, there are some people who came and they start writing things. And Banksy, when he came, he came after. So I remember there was Spanish artists and Mexicans that uh, did something at the wall in, near my town. And it's still there till today. So I think it was like uh, for the artists, it was uh, attraction, attraction for them to come and to send messages or to do messages for the rest of the people who are coming, especially in Bethlehem, because Bethlehem is a tourist attraction. And it's a holy city. So they want everybody to see when they pass what's really happening in the city. So that's why, like everything you see it uh, in Bethlehem, the street art and uh, all the activities happening in Bethlehem. And do you want to talk a little bit about the refugee camp that's there? Because I think people understand and or they've heard that refugee camps can become permanent places, but this one you really just seen it. I really was like, oh, this is a this is a permanent place. <laughs> like <laughs> for a long, long time. Yeah. When my mother family came, you know, in the beginning, they thought that they will be, um, they will leave their village for two weeks, one month, and that's it. That's why they didn't take many things with them. They just took the value things. And like anyone, when he leaves the house, he will take the key. And here it's important to have, you know, when you, when you know that you are leaving, for some time, you will take the ownership papers that prove that you have a land so that no one will come while you are not there and take take it and then claim that it's yours, especially at that time. When they arrive, they start walking, walking. They arrive near Bethlehem and uh, the UN gathered them and put them in tents. In the beginning of the 50s, they start giving them uh, breaks to build small houses. And when people start working, I think they realize, or people by time realize, that they are not going back. So that's why when you go to, you know, when you go to the refugee camp and you tell people this is a refugee camp, people are like, but are, are crazy? This is not a refugee camp. This is a neighborhood. 
But it is a refugee camp. But because people, in a way, realize that there is no chance for them to go back until there is an agreement. And it is known as the right of return of all the Palestinians who left in 48 and 67. But for the Israelis, they will not accept that. Because for them, if they recognize that right and the majority of the Palestinians decided to go back, it will be difficult. It will affect the number of Israelis and Palestinians inside Israel. And then the Palestinians will be the majority. The Israelis will be the minority, then it's a problem for them. So that's why they are still there in the refugee camps. They can leave. They can, like anyone can leave the refugee camp. But they say, if you want to leave the refugee camp, we prefer to go back to our original homeland inside Israel or Palestine. So generations have been brought up in this refugee camp, correct? Yeah, now I have like, yeah, I think you're talking about the third or the fourth generation now there. Wow. That's one of the things I like about going places is you can read about a place and you can see videos, but just seeing it with your own eyes, it hits home what some of these words really mean. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. So it's so the fourth generation to be brought up in this refugee camp in Bethlehem and and. The thing is, is that there's no end in sight. There are going to be fifth and sixth generations if things continue like this. That's true, yeah. So as far as the Waldhof Hotel, do you want to tell us a little bit about the history of it and when and how did you decide to put it on your tour? It's almost like now, I think it's a couple of months that they opened it. So by the time you arrived, it was already open to the public. I think they started building it or doing it last year. And it's owned by one of my friends who live there. So there is no much history about <laughs> it. <laughs> it's just, you know, it happened like that. And what made people come is that they heard that Banksy had uh, some of his uh, art in the hotel. and But you cannot see all of them. You can see two or three. The rest is in the rooms. So if you want to see them, you have to rent uh, a room there. One of the things, and I don't know how much of his design was in it versus how much of somebody else's was, like, I don't know. So there's a museum in there and then there's the whole parlor is decorated and then there's a gallery. I didn't go into the gallery, but the aesthetic of it, regardless of where Banksy's work ends and somebody else on the team's work begins, it all meshes very well together to really just, it's, I mean, it's basically messing with your mind about what is freedom and what is, it's very intense. Just even, it's it's a really good example of how art can make you think, um, especially when it, you're confronted with so much of it. What was your reaction the first time you went in? When I entered, it was impressive to see it, you know, when you entered the lobby. And the first thing is when, uh, when you see the monkey at the entrance, <laughs> yeah. and then you enter and you see all that. And when I went to the museum, it brought back lots of memories, how things started, you know, and you remember many things about living in the West Bank uh, between, like the situation that started from 2000 to like 2005 or six. So it was difficult, some, uh, difficult in a way to remember all that. And, and also they were talking about some what's happening in Gaza, the, war, the Gaza war and everything. But I was impressed and I decided immediately that we need to put it uh, as part of the tour. And people love that. And the people that they work with, they, you know, they love that. And also, every time when I have a group, they immediately ask me, are we going to the hotel? Are we going to the hotel? I tell them, yeah, we're going to the hotel. So, yeah. <laughs> Which is strange because, I mean, it really, I was, so I was there in March and it had just opened a few weeks before. I was really lucky that my trip happened to coincide. You know, I don't think I knew anything about it before, too long before my trip even, because the publicity hadn't really started coming out. The opening, there was the opening, and the funny thing, it came at the same night, I think I remember it happened at the same night, when they had the results of the Arab Idol, because <laughs> there was, uh, <laughs> the one who won the Arab Idol was from Bethlehem, 
So I think it came at the same time. Then they had to close it for some time, for a few days, to finish everything. And then they said, okay, we will uh, reopen it again. And they talked about having another opening, but I think that I think they are waiting till the road next to them is finished because now they, I don't know if you, when you came, you saw that they were working there in that area. So it was difficult for anyone to stay there, not in the inside, but outside. So I think maybe they will do another opening and bring everybody to see it. It was really impressive just as a project, but then also I thought the museum was a really smart contribution because it does... So if you're in the West Bank and you're not on a tour, but you're not staying at that hotel, you still have a reason to go to the hotel and see it. The museum costs what, like 15? 15 shekel, shekel, yeah, 15 shekel. Which I want to say is like five or six dollars, but I'm not, it, it was not so expensive that it didn't, like, I think I was the only person on my tour that went in. But I was really happy that I did at the end. And um, you even had to come get me and tell me it was time to go. <laughs> There's so much. Yeah, the thing is, I would, tell, I would tell you, the thing is that there are, we want to give more time to the people to see it. But uh, there are others who are not interested. And this is the some of the challenges we face, you know, when you have the tours that you will people who want to spend more time and others, they just, okay, we saw it, we want to leave. But sometimes we give the option for people, if you want to stay, you can stay. And I forgot to tell you that, <laughs> but you can stay. <laughs> But you can stay, and then we can arrange for you a car to take you back. Like, you don't have to leave immediately with the bus. Oh, that's nice. I mean, I don't know if I would have done that just because I was so tired, but that's a really nice option for people. I think the West Bank is somewhere where most people won't have, most people won't have multiple opportunities if they're coming from America or North America to go multiple times, just because it's such a long trip to get to Israel in the first place. And then... To go, you know, it's not somewhere that people automatically think this is. I'm gonna go there two or three times, if you know, if you're from America. But I really do think that I need to go back because I feel like one day was a really good intro. But now, because like once you get somewhere, all of your weird fears about it just go away because you're like, every time I've gone somewhere that I was afraid to go before I got there, it's like, oh wait, this is a totally normal place where people are totally normal, and like everything that you hear is mostly ridiculous propaganda. Unless you're my mother, in which case she thinks everything's real. <laughs> Hi, mom. I mean, like, you know, like, I grew up in the Midwest. I moved to the inner city in Philly to teach. You know, like, it's just, like, every step. So I think that once I got there and I realized this really is a normal, lovely place. And it's got a lot of government-imposed problems. But that's really mostly imposed like once you get there it's like i really do feel like i should go back and spend some more time now that i i mean how many people really feel like they're gonna get two or three chances to go that's not a typical that's not typically what people get it's like that might be their trip of a lifetime to go to israel and palestine yeah when, when you came you know when you were in the bus i looked at you know i look at the faces of everybody and they say okay now we are in the weird place now something will happen or all of that <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now we will start with the propaganda and all that. The thing is, like, you know, when we start, you know, walking in the cities of Ramallah and then the market and we let everybody relax and enjoy and everything. So this is one of the things that we want to do. It's more about people should, you are coming on a tour, you should be relaxed. We are not in a hurry. Everything is on time. We are here to enjoy. But I know that, as I said, it's difficult because also there are many places to see. And there is no, like, you only have, like, maybe a few days or one week or something like that. And you cannot, you want to see as much as you can. So we try to provide that, but we don't rush anyone. We want them to relax and enjoy the, the adventure. I had a really good day, just as a day tour. It's a, it was a really good day. But I do think that, like, that first 30 minutes, you let, because, I mean, there's all this hype before you go about make sure you have your passport and certain people can't go. Like I think certain Israelis can't go or something. And you know, there are some rules and you do see signs. And the first thing, place we get, you go to is the Jordan river, which does have guards on both sides in Israel and Jordan. There are guards or in Palestine and Jordan. There are guards. There are Israeli guards in Palestine. But as soon as you get into Ramallah, you're like, this is a city. <laughs> if you, 
are thinking about visiting Palestine that you definitely should. And it is very easy to obviously fly into Jerusalem. It's pretty easy to get there, especially if you're staying in Jerusalem on a tour like one of your tours. And um, do you want to tell everybody what your tour website is in case they're interested in, in case they're actually going to be there and want to contact you? Uh, we're working now on the website. We are doing uh, developing the website. It's uh, tamertours.com. The best is to email me because I, I forgot the name of the website. I think it's a different, it's a different, I think they put a different name, but they have to remember it. But if they want to come, they can email me at Tamara Tamar Tours. You know, if they want to come, they can email me and I will be glad to show them around. All right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, in the show notes, there'll be a link to the post on my website about this episode and there'll be the pictures you're going to send. I'll have some pictures from my visit and then we'll put links and I'll also put your email address. So if people are going and they want to make sure to hook up with your tour, um, which I highly recommend. And I just met you randomly through a hostel. You partner with some hostels or a hostel in Jerusalem and that's how I met you, but you can also book directly through you, correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, uh, What's happening now that people email me either through Facebook or my email and they say we want to come. So, yeah, we can arrange that for them. You know, we arrange for them transportation, even if they want to spend the night in the West Bank, like in Ramallah or in Bethlehem, we arrange that for them. And, of course, the tours and the food and everything. Oh, the food. So go for the food. <laughs> like, just go for the food. You don't even have to do anything else. <laughs> Yeah, well, we we are thinking, you know, once we were talking about making a tour, it's called uh, Food, Beer, and Shisha. Oh, yeah. I would pay for that tour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I so think, I don't know what your prices are, and I don't exactly remember what I paid, but I didn't do it as like a sponsored tour. I just booked a tour, but it was one of the coolest things that I did while I was there. And Israel is not a cheap place to travel around. So I think sometimes it's hard to be like, I'm going to spend this little bit of extra money when you're already spending money in Israel, but if you, but it's, it was like the most rewarding thing I did that whole week. So I would highly recommend it. The prices, it depends on what people want to see and how much time. So we always give, you know, we give them like a special price because they tell us, okay, we want to go to this area or we want to do this. We want to do this. So we cannot just give them, put everything, but there is also like fixed tours that people, if they want to sign up, they sign up and they know the price for it. Yeah. And also with that, it's like, if it's convenient, it's like convenience versus getting something custom done. But either way, I would tell I would say I highly recommend reaching out to you because it was really excellent and eye opening. And also thank you so much for doing this interview. I really, you did not have to spend an hour of your time <laughs> re-explaining things you already taught me. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, well, you are lucky that there is no football matches tonight. <laughs> I want to say thank you again to Tamar Halasi for coming on the show. For those of you who have subscribed to the show already, thank you. If you want more episodes, please subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would take a moment to rate and review the show, it helps tremendously with helping others to find the podcast. For our next episode, we will be going over the history of Mycenae in Greece with John Bennett, who's the director of the British School of Athens and a professor of Aegean archaeology at the University of Sheffield. We'll discuss the Agamemnon from Homer, the discovery of what we know today as his mask and tomb, and how the original Mycenaeans compare to their Homeric counterparts. The prize for this week's giveaway is a $20 Amazon gift card. If you'd like to enter, follow the link in the show notes for the blog post on this episode on historyfangirl.com. All you have to do to enter is be a newsletter subscriber and leave a comment in the post. Good luck!